Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fries again with video K that focuses on bulk fluid flow in the capillary beds, the second major function of capillary beds. When we talk about bulk fluid flow in the capillary beds, we're literally referring to the fluid that will always leave a capillary bed at the arterial end. And the fluid or the the a partial amount of that fluid that just left will actually return to the venule end of the capillary bed. What happens at the arterial end is called filtration. What, ends, what happens at the venule end is called reabsorption. So notice that we're always going to talk about capillary beds as having an arterial end, which is of course where your arterial feeds in, and a venule end which is, of course, where your post-capillary venule starts. The end result of this process is interstitial fluid, fluid that left the bloodstream that's going to become part of the lymphatic system, better referred to as lymph. Now, if this process doesn't work properly, if bulk fluid flow doesn't work properly in the capillary beds, to the extent that too much fluid leaves and does not return to the bloodstream. And this, if this is the case, edema will result. Edema shows up as very swollen parts of the body, often the legs. Bulk fluid flow in the capillary beds depends completely on pressure gradients. And there are going to be two types of pressures we're going to discuss. Hydrostatic pressures at the arterial and venule end and osmotic pressures at the arterial and venule end. Hydrostatic pressure is really just another way of referring to blood pressure. Of course, we're discussing blood pressure in the capillaries now. And we're going to have an arterial end, and we're going to have a venule end. Osmotic pressure, you might recall, is primarily a result of the amount of albumin. Also other proteins, but especially albumin. Albumin is what is going to ensure that water stays within the blood bloodstream. Um, albumin increases osmotic pressure, which is therefore going to prevent from too much water leaking out. And again, we're going to be talking about the osmotic pressure at the arterial end versus the venule end. So if we now come and take a look at um, the picture here below, just to give you uh, an overview, you may want to come back to this picture after uh, all of all of the details have been discussed because it's a nice summary. But I'm just going to give you a quick overview. So you can always tell in which direction the blood flows because at the arterial end we will be not only oxygen rich and at the venule end oxygen poorer from there the red versus the blue colors illustrated here. But we're going to see that in healthy individuals the net filtration pressure at the arterial end will always be a positive pressure. Pressure is always expressed in millimeters of mercury. And that's what's going to force some of the fluid in the blood of the capillary to be pushed out by means of filtration. You can always tell where the venous end or the venule end is in healthy individuals because there the net filtration pressure, we'll learn what that is momentarily, is always going to be in the negative. And the negative pressure allows for fluids to seep back in and we'll refer to that as reabsorption. You've learned the term reabsorption more often in association with the reabsorption or the absorption, I should say, of um, nutrients in the small intestine. But we'll be using reabsorption here at the level of the capillary beds. We'll use the term reabsorption also in the kidneys. And we use the term reabsorption because we're 
implying the fact that we're taking back something that was lost earlier, in this case at the arterial end via filtration. Notice that in the middle part of our capillary, we're not going to have much of a net filtration pressure, and so we don't really see much of any bulk fluid flow occurring here. So let's better define the two pressures. So hydrostatic pressure, as I said, refers to the capillary blood pressure. I don't think I need to express that any better. We've learned about the definition of blood pressure. And we're going to, for simplicity's sake, abbreviate it as HPC, referring to hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries. Once again, we're going to have an arterial end versus a venule end. Osmotic pressure, as I said, is primarily due to our albumin proteins. They are responsible for hold, holding the water inside of our capillaries, and we'll abbreviate that with OPC, arterial end versus venule end. Now, if we compare these pressures, at the arterial end, you would expect for our hydrostatic pressure to be higher, right? I'm just going to say high probably more like around approximately, we'll give you more exact numbers here in a moment, uh, 40 millimeters of mercury. While at this end, the hydrostatic pressure is going to be low. So we see a drop in hydrostatic pressure from the arterial end to the venule end. You've learned all this already. This should not be new information. When we take a look at the osmotic pressure, we see that that is pretty constant throughout the whole capillary bed. So the osmotic pressure here is going to be, I'm just put, going to put same um, as at this end. All right. So really it's the fluctuations in the, the capillary blood pressure, better referred to as hydrostatic pressure in our scenario here, that can impact um, how much fluid is going to leak and be reabsorbed unless a person has a condition that impacts, for instance, the production of albumin or the breakdown of albumin, um, osmotic pressure shouldn't really change very much. Now these two pressures that we just discussed are not just present in the blood, they're also present in the fluid outside of the blood, which we'll refer to as interstitial fluid, and we'll abbreviate it with IF. So we're going to talk about the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid at the arterial end and at the venule end, and we're going to talk about the osmotic pressure at the arterial end and the venule end of the interstitial fluid. Now, the the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid is always pretty close to zero. So rather negligent. It fluctuates a little bit, maybe one or two millimeters of mercury, but for simplicity's sake, we're going to just set it to zero. Similar principle for the osmotic pressure. We really shouldn't have a whole lot of proteins in the interstitial fluid, just a minimal amount. And so once again, we're going to set that number for simplicity's sake, uh, for now, as we're learning about the formula, to zero. So how do we calculate net filtration pressure then? How do we calculate the impact of both the hydrostatic pressures and the osmotic pressures at the arterial end versus the venule end? Well, we do it by this major sub subtraction. So we're literally subtracting osmotic pressure from hydrostatic pressure uh, between the capillaries and the interstitial fluid. And when we use numbers that um, will help us better understand how all of this bulk fluid flow, flu fluid flow works, um, let's then use for our hydrostatic pressure at the arterial end inside of the capillary, I'm sorry, I should put that here, hydrostatic pressure of the capillary here, let's say that it's, it's 35 as it shows over here. All right, so let's set that to 35. We're going to assume that the hydrostatic pressure over here in the interstitial fluid is very close to zero. 
and that's this zero here. So this, the difference between the hydrostatic pressure at the arterial, the hydrostatic pressures at the arterial end is going to be 35 minus zero, which equals 35, obviously. If we now look at the um, um, difference in the osmotic pressures at the arterial end, then the osmotic pressure due to the presence of the albumins in the capillaries at the arterial end is approximately 25. And once again, in the interstitial fluid, the osmotic pressure is very close to zero. It's not exactly zero, but again, just for simplicity's sake for now. And so when we calculate the difference between 25 and zero, we get 25. We now finish our formula, 35 minus 25 ends up with plus 10. So our net filtration pressure is going to be plus 10. Our NFP is plus 10. The plus implies that we have a push that is forcing the blood outward. So fluid is literally going to be pushed out here from there, that red arrow pointing out of the blood vessel. And this process we call filtration. As fluids are literally being pushed out because of this um, pressure gradient that results in a net filtration pressure of about plus 10, that process we call filtration. Our net filtration pressure is pretty much zero halfway in um, the capillary. And then it changes again as we get to the venule end. And as said earlier, osmotic pressure is not going to change much between arterial and venule end. So let's fill those out here for a moment. So osmotic pressure for the interstitial fluid is going to remain at about zero and osmotic pressure of the capillary at the venule end is going to remain at about 25. So you see that number here for osmotic pressure of the capillary and here is the zero for osmotic pressure of the interstitial fluid. What does change is the hydrostatic pressure or in other words the blood pressure in the capillary. You know by now that the blood pressure in the capillary as it reaches the venule end is going to decrease. And so what we see is that it's going to decrease down to about um, 18. So let's fill that in here. And the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid at the venule end is going to remain pretty much at zero, which is what you see here. So if we now complete um, our subtra sub sub subtractions <laughs> for our net filtration pressure formula, we get 18 minus 25, which results in minus seven. So this net filtration pressure of minus seven at the venule end, that minus indicates that we're now drawing in fluid. We're drawing fluid back in due to the pressure gradients that are generated by both hydrostatic pressures as well as osmotic pressures at the venule end in the capillary and outside of the capillary. And that process we refer to as reabsorption. So this whole mechanism is really important for you to understand and you should really play with all kinds of different numbers. Perhaps you can find on YouTube or somewhere on the internet somebody else explaining this with different numbers. And please practice all you can because this is a mechanism that is very similar to what we see happening in the kidneys as well. So calculating net filtration pressure is important for you to be able to do. On a test, I might give you various numbers for these hydrostatic and osmotic pressures without even telling you what the arterial end is and what the venule end is. 
um, you should be able to recognize the arterial end with the fact that its hydrostatic pressure is always going to have to be higher than the, the venous end, obviously. I can also give you an exercise where I do give you specific numbers for osmotic pressure pressures and in real life the osmotic pressure shouldn't change much um, between the arterial end or the venule end. Um, the osmotic pressure should be close to zero in the interstitial fluid but realize that you should be able to play with numbers for these uh, osmotic pressures as well. And then a scenario to think about is what if, what if we had an individual whose liver wasn't functioning properly and consequently the osmotic pressure of the capillaries was much lower than 25. Ask yourself how does that impact net filtration pressure and then ask yourself how much of the fluid is therefore going to either stay in the vessel or leave the vessel. By that I mean not an exact number but are we going to see much more leaving of fluid or much more reabsorbing of fluid. So think about that. Um, these are conditions for you that you will be dealing with um, in your future career. Edema in particular is a condition that you really need to understand based on this mechanism and based on the function of albumins in the bloodstream. Don't forget, albumins are made by the liver. So patients with problems with liver function may have problems with the synthesis of albumins and very often you will see swelling or edema in those kinds of patients.